Let us give him the kind of welcome deserved of somebody who has made such a contribution as he addresses the theme combating racism through transformative education. Everybody, Professor Hakim Abu. Well, thank you so much. Uh, first of all, let me, I might have to lean on this later. Let me come out here first. First of all, thank you so much for inviting me to Liverpool. Um, I don't get invited here very often. I'm not quite sure what I've done to deserve such a fate. Um, but it's very rare that I'm invited to speak here. So I'm very, very delighted to be here amongst you. Particularly honored to be asked to give the Dorothy Kuya Memorial Lecture. Um, and I want to thank uh, Paul and everybody at International Slavery Museum and everybody else connected with this evening. Um, as I say, it's a great honor to be here. Thank you so much for um, the many people who, some of you that I know, have come out on a Tuesday evening. I know Tuesday evening is all sorts of important things going on in the world that you could be doing. Um, but you've come tonight, and I'm very grateful for, for all of you to be here. Um, it's uh, actually a very important evening. And I have to apologize for being slightly underdressed. I was expecting to have some time to, to change into my lecturing apparel. Um, but Lawrence uh, took me on a tour of Liverpool, <laughs> lasted the whole afternoon, and I didn't have any chance to go back to the hotel <laughs> and to come straight here. So I apologize for my appearance but I'll do the best I can dressed as I am uh, at the moment. Um, I wanted to, to really to sh just to share with you some, uh, some history, uh, we could say, some history that we should all be familiar with, and some history you may not be familiar with, which is kind of related to, to me. Um, Paul was very kind in presenting some information about my work and career. Um, and I guess if you, if you don't really know the story of some of those things, it, it may sound, I don't know how it sounds to people. Um, uh, Paul, Paul said I, I started at SARS in 1976, but he didn't tell you when I finished at <laughs> SARS. Um, because I actually finished at SOAS in 1994. <laughs> so that's nearly 20 years um, to do a, a degree and a PhD. In fact, I did two PhDs, uh, one and a half PhDs. That's not, uh, I'm not boasting about how many I did, but I'm um, just showing how, actually how difficult it was. Um, and I had to have two goes at doing it just to get one. And even the one I did took me seven years to do. So. As he was reading out all these things, what I was thinking about was, God, how long that took and how difficult it was and what a struggle it was and so on. And that is um, that theme, if you like, or that issue of struggle is kind of appropriate for this particular day that we're commemorating. Um, and I brought some visual aids. Let's see if this works. Okay. So we often think about this as Slavery Day or International Slavery Day, but technically International Day for Remembrance of Slave Trade and its abolition. And in a city such as this, there's naturally a lot of focus on what people refer to as the slave trade, really the, uh, we can say, the, that great crime against humanity, which involved the human trafficking of African men, women, and children, of which this city played such a, a central role. In fact, such a central role that I don't need to mention it. Um, 
but we, we perhaps don't think very much about um, abolition, how this terrible crime against humanity was ended. And I want to say a little bit about that tonight. But the second thing, just by way of introduction, that the theme for this day, or actually tomorrow, is normally commemorated on August the 23rd, but the theme for this year's commemoration is fighting slavery's legacy of racism through transformative education. So it's important that when we, we find this often uh, today in Britain, that various politicians tell us, well, that, oh, of course, all this, uh, you know, slavery and colonialism, it's all a long time ago. And uh, why are you so concerned about it? You should just forget about it. You know, there's some great criminal somewhere who somebody makes a statue of, and the people of that particular city, so that's insulting to us as citizens of this city to have a, a criminal, uh, a mass murderer in the middle of our city, uh, glorified. And we want to get rid of that statue. And they spend years campaigning and nobody takes any notice. Even the mayor of the city tries to do something about it. Eventually, the people of the city say, well, this is just ridiculous. We're just going to get rid of it. And they do what you know, is a quite reasonable thing of getting rid of this uh, criminal, refuse to have that insult in the middle of their city. And the powers that be say, well, what are you doing? Uh, why, are you, uh, why are you people so obsessed with... It all happened a very long time ago. Somebody wants to put up a statue. And it was not a big problem or so. But in fact, the, without going into all the ramifications of these things, as this suggests, of course, in a city like this, the legacy is all around us. In fact, we're in a, this room is a legacy. But there's also another legacy which is very, very important in the modern day, and that's the legacy of racism. Of course, some people would say, well, there's not much racism around today. But you only have to be, not many people here, maybe. But you only have to watch football every weekend to see that people don't get down on one knee because they want to have a rest before the game starts. They go down on one knee because they're of their concern with this legacy of slavery and so on, which is still very much with us and which plagues our society in various forms. And I won't go into all because you're familiar with them. But the day that we're celebrating, as I said, is not about human trafficking as such, but about the abolition of it. And so I want to talk a little bit by way of introduction about that international abolitionist movement. So this night and tomorrow morning are the anniversary of the famous Haitian Revolution, which is generally recognized as breaking out on the night of the 22nd of August and the morning of the 23rd. So this is the night when the Haitian Revolution began. So what, what is this Haitian Revolution all about? Now, of course, you guys in Liverpool have celebrated this day since, what, 1999, I think it is. So you're familiar, everybody's familiar with that Revolution? No, how is that possible? How is that possible? Hang on, how is that possible? But you've been celebrating it for 24 years in this city. How can you not be familiar with that very important revolution? I mean, we could say, why, how is it not possible? Because if I say, well, you know something about the French Revolution, you'd say, yes, you knew something about the French Revolution? Okay. Or the Industrial Revolution? Okay. Or maybe even the English Revolution. Some people forget there was a revolution here. We won't go into that as well. But the Haitian Revolution. Probably the most important revolution of the 18th century. Okay, so what can we say about it? Well, this particular picture or painting is a painting of a famous battle, the Battle of Vertier which took place in November 1803, and it's seen as being one of the last battles in the revolutionary struggle of the people of Haiti. 
And that struggle in itself is worth remembering. I said it began on the night of August the 22nd, August the 23rd, but it began in 1791. So that revolution took place over the, how many years is that? 12, 12 years, only 13 years of revolution. It's kind of worth remembering. As we're familiar with revolutions, they last a couple of years or last, it's lasted 13 years. And it's the only revolution in history, successful revolution in history of enslaved people. And just to give you an idea of the conditions of enslaved people in Haiti at that time, or Saint-Domingue as it was known, uh, the life expectancy was seven years. So from when people were landed ashore in that, on that island, their normal life expectancy was seven years. So these people managed to wage a struggle for nearly 13 years. And what was the nature of that struggle? They said, well, we, we've, we're fed up with this uh, being enslaved. And we're going to liberate ourselves. That in itself was a kind of amazing accomplishment. And we were talking today about how we get together and how we change things and how we get the kind of museum we want and how we should discuss things and how difficult it is. So how did they do it? Of course, one question I always ask my students is what language did they speak, these half a million enslaved people who rose up? Everybody gives different answers to what it might be. Because maybe they spoke different languages. Most of them were born in Africa. So one of the things about the Haitian Revolution is it's an African revolution. They were all African, born in Africa, the vast majority of them. They spoke different languages. They'd only been there for less than seven years. How do they communicate with each other? Okay, they had some common language, but very, very complicated. And Liverpool, we all speak the same language. We're trying to sort out these museum problems. So these guys decided, okay, we're going to get together, we're going to organize this revolution. Then how do you sustain it for 13 years? Some of us have been, I'm involved in a struggle at the moment, as some of you know, over my job and the work that I do. We've been engaged for about six weeks now. Everybody's tired. <laughs> Can we go on any longer? <laughs> 13 years. So this struggle that went on for 13 years, in the course of it, as I said, for the first time in history, those who were enslaved, united, men and women from different places. And then they had to take on the three principal armies of Europe, the army of Britain, the army of France, and the army of Spain. They beat all of them. Wiped them out, not wiped them out, but obliterated them. And went on to liberate themselves on 1st of January, 1804. And they ushered in this new country of Haiti. And of course, if you, some of you listen to the news, you'll know that Haiti is in the news. It's very often Haiti is in the news because of what happened subsequently and how the French uh, slave owners uh, weak wreaked their revenge with the support of Britain and other countries and so on. Yes, Britain was involved in all of that as well. So this is anyway what we're commemorating tonight and tomorrow. This is the event, or if you like, the event which is being remembered. And it was a very, very important revolution. I'm not going to go into it in any greater detail. Um, one of the things that it did, it, it ushered into being the first modern conception of human rights. Some people think that was brought into being by the French Revolution or the American Revolution, but of course that wasn't the case uh, because of the discriminatory nature of the American Constitution, the French Constitution, and so on. But the uh, Haitian Constitution was genuinely uh, human-centered. It said everybody's black. Didn't matter where you came from, what color you were, everybody's black. This is what an advanced P 
piece of thinking. So this is what they brought into being. And of course, they did all sorts of other things, which I won't go into now. So this is what we're commemorating, and it shows, the, it shows all of us the importance of struggle. That whatever, whatever situation you're in, if you unite, if you organize yourselves, if you're determined, you can transform, transform that situation. And of course, even in Britain, the Haitian Revolution had a profound impact. And of course, you've all studied British history, so you know that. And just as an example of it, I thought I'd just show you, I, don't, no, I know in the back you can't read this because I know the impoverishment of the city of Liverpool. It wasn't possible to provide a bigger screen so everybody could see it, but we'll have to make do with this one. So this is a poem by William Wilberforce. Most of you will have heard of him. Sorry, did I say Wilberforce? God, that's a Freudian slip. Sorry, William Wordsworth. <laughs> William Wordsworth, I beg, I beg his pardon, I beg both of their pardons. William Wordsworth, the famous English poet. It's actually, you can see it's actually written in 1803 at a time of, um, anyway, when Toussaint Lewis's death, actually. Um, but it, without going into it and analysing it, you can read it for yourselves easily enough. You can't read it now, you can read it online. But it's a kind of eulogy, in a way, to what Toussaint Louverture stood for. And we sometimes, maybe we forget that, that the, the great impression that this revolution and Toussaint Louverture was one of the most famous leaders made in Britain. And just as I've said to you now, this could be a demonstration of what we can all achieve. That's how it was seen at the time, particularly by working people. And of course, working people in Britain at that time had no right, no political rights at all. They didn't have the right to vote at all. So it was very inspiring to people here. Uh, and it inspired many people. In fact, the anti-slavery society, which uh, was organized in Britain at that time, was kind of resurrected as a result of the Haitian Revolution. And of course, some of you will know that the Parliamentary Act to abolish human trafficking for British citizens was brought into being just three or four years, three years actually after the triumph of the Haitian Revolution. And it's not no, co no coincidence that those two things happened very close to each other. Of course, in the normal rendering of things, uh, abolition occurs because of people like William Wilberforce or the the mother of all parliaments, the enlightened British parliament. And it's very confusing for people to understand how Britain, that was the leading human trafficker in the 18th century, seven years into the 19th century, could suddenly become the greatest abolitionist power in the world. What, what happened in that period? Well, the key thing that happened was the Haitian Revolution. And the parliamentarians, for that reason, there were other reasons, but one of the reasons was the revolution had broken out in Haiti. The fear that such a revolution may break out in Britain's colonies in the Caribbean and the whole slave system would be uh, abolished. So they just said, okay, we need to take some measures. One of the measures is we shouldn't be importing more African revolutionaries into our colonies. So we better limit that somehow. Of course, there were other reasons, because they worked out that they had more enslaved Africans than all their rivals. So they said, well, if we've got more enslaved Africans than our rivals and we stop everybody else trafficking, then we'll have an economic advantage and so on. Anyway, these are the kind of calculations that went on. I know that you're probably told something else, but one has to look at history to understand these things. So this, anyway, this is the day that we're um, commemorating, or the night that we're commemorating, and that great historic victory of uh, those 13 years. Now, I thought I'd say a little bit more about this idea of transformative education. And again, with this day, we sometimes forget 
what it's about, what are we supposed to be doing, what's it for. So this is what was said earlier this year by the General Secretary of the UN. And of course he highlights again this question of the legacy of slavery and human trafficking. And, uh, and he talks about white supremacist hate that's resurgent today, and again, the legacy of racism. He says the most powerful weapon in our arsenal is education. Well, people may have different views, but this was a view that was expressed in the UN. And then this was the president. I'm just taking part of what was said by the president of the General Assembly, who highlights particularly history, the important educative role of history. Um, and as he says at the end, or she, I don't know if it's a she, but anyway, for this duty of memory to be truly put into practice, we must reshape our education systems and curricula. So the role of education, the theme for this year, transformative education in dealing with one of these legacies of slavery and also a legacy of the whole colonial system, which we could also go into, is how do we, how do we use education um, for that purpose? And of course, education can be uh, thought of very broadly um, so it could be, as I was saying, it could be the press and what educative role is the press play. It could be museums. How are museums being transformative in the way that they educate people? Or it could be those of us who are educationalists, or it could be others who have, can play that role in using education as a transformative uh, tool or transformative weapon. Um, but of course, in any of these endeavors, there's, there's a, a struggle going on because, as I mentioned earlier, history is kind of very much under threat. It's, it's, history is always contested. Um, there's a saying, isn't there, until the lions have their historians, tales of the hunt will always glorify the hunter. Um, so history is always contested. Um, and, but we're seeing now in particular that history coming under threat from the powers that be, various governments. People automatically think of what's going on in the US, but it's under attack here as well, very much so. Um, and certainly the powers that be, government ministers and so on, are trying to uh, impose their own particular views of history. And there have been many examples over the last few years. Um, I remember only just a few, few years ago, Boris Johnson, you remember him? Yeah. And uh, Michael Goh is another one. They were just, I'm just giving an example now. They were talking about the First World War. And there was a big thing, and they were saying, well, it's, of course it was all the Germans, so that's what it was all about. Um, one of them said, the other said, well, it was all about Belgium. You know, Paul, it was saving Western civilization, defending Belgium and so on. Well, anyone who studies history knows that, first of all, there's nothing about any of that. Um, in fact, Belgium had just been, or the king of Belgium had just been responsible for the deaths of 10 million Africans. What, what civilization is that about? Um, and in fact, we could say the First World War was a war to, as one person wanted to say, it was a, a war between two gangs of robbers as to how they could divide the world between them. And if you look at what happened after, before the war, you see that Africa was divided, and after the war it was redivided. Of course, other places were divided and redivided as well. Um, but our politicians try and tell you it was about something else. So anyway, I just say that to, to demonstrate that history is contested and um, to, if you like, to present history as it should be, to present the facts of history is always a struggle. Um, even that people should hear the facts, even to know that this day is commemorating the Haitian Revolution, perhaps is something which has been suppressed, I don't know. Um, 
in this city. Maybe that's the case, I don't know, or more generally. So that brings me then to say something about the initiative that Paul mentioned, which we call History Matters, and what that is all about. Um, and to tell you something of my own sort of recent work and recent history, which may have some bearing or some usefulness in what people are concerned about in Liverpool. So we started talking about History Matters in 2014, which is, what, nine years ago now. And the, the occasion for starting it was a, a headline in the Times Educational Supplement, whatever it's called. And the headline was, last year only three black students, I think, three black students studied to become teachers, studied to become history teachers. So when we talk about the legacy of slavery, though these legacies manifest themselves in different ways that we're not necessarily clear about. So the article was saying that the previous year, only three black people, people of African or Caribbean heritage, studied at teacher training college in this country to become history teachers. So when I read that, I thought, that can't be right. Three? in the whole country? What is that? There must be something wrong there. I just read the article. Okay, various facts and so on. But strange and peculiar though it appeared to be, it sort of resonated with my own experience, which was that in my own profession as of history and historians as, as an academic, there weren't very many people like me around. Um, hardly any, actually. And there seemed to be very few postgraduate students studying history, like Lawrence doing PhDs and so on. Hardly any. So I began to kind of reflect on this and think, well, maybe there's something rather worrying going on here, and we need to look into it. So a few of us got together and began to just look into what's actually going on. Um, and we found that, just to give you just a couple of examples, we found that in Britain there's something like 16,000 secondary school history teachers. Of those 16,000, only, I can't remember exactly what it was at that time, something like 230 were teachers of African or Caribbean heritage. So that struck me as a very tiny percentage. Then we looked into the statistics for those people studying history at university from African and Caribbean backgrounds. And we found that history actually was the third least popular subject amongst young black undergraduates. Only agriculture and veterinary science were more unpopular than history. Now, if you you're in Liverpool, or you're in London, or you're in any city or any place. Generally speaking, amongst people of African and Caribbean heritage, there'll be all kinds of history things going on. There'll be people doing heritage walks. There'll be uh, people tracing their ancestry. There'll be all various projects. There'll be black history classes going on. All kinds of things going on. You could probably say of all the different populations in the country, those from African and Caribbean heritage are probably some of the people most likely to be interested in history. But actually, for young people, they, were, they, weren't, they weren't particularly interested in it. They weren't studying it. And then we looked into the school statistics about who did A-levels and GCSEs and what happened. And we found that every stage of education, young black people stopped studying history, dropped out of it as soon as they could. Even if they got good results, they wouldn't go on and do it at the next level. So. We thought something rather worrying was going on in that regard. It's just maybe it's not important to other people, but we thought it was worrying. And so we uh, contacted various organizations we thought would be concerns the Historical Association, the Royal Historical Society, the Higher Education Funding Council, 
I said, oh, aren't you aware of this problem? No. Or if you are aware of it, are you doing anything about it? No. So we said, okay, well then, if nobody's interested in doing anything about it, we should do something about it. So we called a conference in London, and we said, okay, we want to know what's going on. We had an idea what was going on, but we want to know what's going on. So we got together uh, the people concerned, the experts, people who are studying at school, people who are studying as undergraduates, one or two postgraduates, and a couple of history teachers, and we had a couple of people who were researching this topic, you could say. But it was mainly young people, students, who, came, who were the speakers, as well as in the audience. And they spoke and they discussed and said, and generally, there were various things that were said, but the overriding thing that was said was, well, we don't like history, because it's not about us. It's not about people who look like us. It's not about our families. It's about the white men of property. Um, it's insulting. It's boring. It's Eurocentric. It's racist. <laughs> All these kind of things. That's what they said. And if any of you remember 2020, during the Black Lives Matter protests, young people said the same things, they? That's said, all we ever hear about. If we hear anything about black people, it's about slavery. Uh, we don't hear this. If we hear anything, it's about something that happened in the US. It's not about us. It's not about, it doesn't deal with our world. It doesn't deal with anything positive. At the conference, we actually heard that some kids would go through most of their schooling, and all they would ever learn was about slavery. That's all they ever heard. Even they had to reenact it. Every year, you'd reenact something for, I mean, what is that, not child abuse? So that's what happens to the kids of African and Caribbean heritage. What about the other kids? What impression would they get if they were at school and they ever only heard anything about slavery? What impact would that have on their young minds? Anyway, the conference was held, and it's, we said, OK, well, people have identified the problem. What's the solution? Then? So people put forward various things. We had a whole lot of recommendations of what should happen. And then we all went home. <laughs> and I said, OK, so what's going to happen next? Everybody disappeared. Anyway, not quite everybody. But we, we decided that, okay, we had to uh, put some of these things into operation. Now, I wanted to see how many of you notice our History Matters image, our History Matters banner there, because there's a picture on it. And I'm going to bring it up for you to see if anybody knows what this picture is. So this is a, an image actually from the Haitian Revolution. And this is a representation of Toussaint Louverture, who you will have heard of, the famous leader, one of the famous leaders of the Haitian Revolution. On the other side is, I won't even bother to mention his name, but he was, a, he was the general leading the British forces in Haiti. Britain, in, Britain invaded during the revolution. And basically, he's surrendering. This is a picture of the leader, of the commander-in-chief of the British Armed Forces surrendering to Toussaint Louverture. His name was actually General Maitland. You can look it up if you want to see it. I don't know, anyway, how often this picture is shown in history classes in this country. Probably not very much. Anyway, that's a bit of a digression. So we said, okay, well, people said at the conference, well, we need something to change the situation. We need something which is transformative, which is educational, but it's transformative education. And one of the things that was suggested, they said, well, we need something for young people to encourage them to engage with history, to do something with history. And so we set up something called the Young Historians Project in 2015 with some of the young people who had attended the conference. And we said, well, you said whatever you said. You said there's a problem. You identified the solution, so you just need to get on with it and organize yourselves and you know, engage. So we supported them, I advised them, and um, anyway, how are we now? 
eight years later, is now national. We have people all over the country. At the moment, about 30 young people between the ages of 16 and 25. And they're all engaged in what we could call educational work, transformative in the sense that they have to decide what history they want to look at. They have to research it, investigate it. We train them how to do that. And then they have to present it to their peers in a form which would be interesting to their peers. So it might be a podcast, it might be a documentary, it might be a, uh, I don't know what things we got here. Uh, actually, this is a presentation. They do a lot of oral history, interviewing their elders about things that happened in ancient times, 1970s, 1980s, last century, <laughs> kind of times, and finding out what happened in the olden days, long before they were born. So, so this was uh, the first project where they were interested. They actually originally said, we want to do something about the Black Panthers, Black Panthers in Britain. So we said, well, actually, some people have done that, but we've, we can think of another organization. So they eventually chose the Black Liberation Front, which was an organization based in London and other places in the 1970s, 1980s. And they interviewed people, they made a film, they had an exhibition. And this is the a kind of launch of that, uh, which I'm sh showing you. Then one of the, the last project they did was about African women. Now, it's an interesting fact, and it's one of the ways in which history is constructed in this country, that, um, not in Liverpool, but in other places, Africans, people who come from the African continent, are very often written out of history. Um, I have to be careful what I say here, because I'm often accused of all sorts of things. But there is a, um, anyway, I won't go into it too much, but there, there's a, the way in which the history of what sometimes be called, people call black British history is presented in a particular way. It all begins in 1948 with a, some kind of ship that comes from somewhere. And the government's even got in on the act. They say we should all celebrate that. So this is one of the biggest myths are going complete nonsense. Of course, if people want to celebrate a ship coming in 1948, it's perfectly reasonable. But why everybody else should celebrate it is another question. But the point is, it's a, it's distorts history. Because, you know, African people were here at least 2,000 years before that. And nobody wants to celebrate the ship that they came on. Anyway, it's a problem. So the young people said, and actually it came out of their experience with the previous project. They said, well, why are there not any people? Because many of them are continental African heritage. Because as you all know, without any boasting going on, those of us who trace our heritage to the African continent are, are a larger part of the population than those who trace their heritage from the Caribbean. I'm just making that distinction. I'm not making any deal about it. It's just a fact. But the, but the point is that it's often ignored. That's, that's the only point I'm making. So they said, well, that doesn't seem right to us. And then they tried to do a Google search for African women. And they couldn't find anything relating to African women in Britain. So they said, well, we need to do a project on African women. So this was the project, and they decided to do something on African women in healthcare. They said, people are always talking about nurses and who come from the Caribbean, and very good. What about nurses who came from Africa? Doctors who came from Africa? Phlebotomists who came from Africa? So they said, okay, we're going to do a project on that. So this was the project that they did. This is actually a mural in, I think it's in Bath Hospital, they decided to, they wanted to present this in mural form in several hospitals, and this is one of those murals. Some of the women in this are uh, historical women from the 1920s, 1930s, 1940s, and some are modern women who work in that hospital. So this was just important for them. I'm just giving a... Um, okay, so that's one of the things that we established 
as a result of that conference, particularly for young people. But then people said, well, what about slightly older people who want to engage with history, who can see the value of history as a transformative weapon and mechanism and instrument? Uh, people who will put off history because of the Eurocentric way in which it's presented, but they love history. They're slightly older maybe, or maybe they're a lot older. But they love history. They would love to come back into education and train to be historians. Why don't you set something up for there? Wouldn't it be great if you could set something up? So in 2018, we established this MRES in the history of Africa and the African diaspora, which was established at master's level. So we could say it was it aimed to be transformative in that it was aimed particularly at students of African and Caribbean heritage, but of course it was open to anybody. But we, we recognize that these particular students were wanted, needed this particular course. And over the five years, that's mainly who we recruited. Um, mainly people in their 40s, 50s, sometimes even older would come and do this course. We'd train them to do research in particular. They'd do a research project. Of course, we also recruited people from the US, from Canada, from the Caribbean, from Africa, even from Asia, because the course was online. Anybody could do it from any part of the world. Um, and so we ran this course for five years. Um, of the students we had, seven of those students went on to do PhDs. It's not, it's not that everybody had to do a PhD, but seven of them wanted to do a PhD. Six of them at the University of Chichester, where I used to teach. <laughs> I still teach. I'm not sure yet. Anyway, um, uh, five of them actually are still there. One of them got her PhD about a month ago. She was our first successful graduate and then went on to do PhD. <laughs> And interestingly enough, she, her book, which is a biography of Jessica Huntley, some of you will have been know Jessica Huntley, was involved with uh, many things, uh, but is perhaps particularly known for uh, uh, Bogle Louverture publications and the bookshop, but Bogo Luvacir is best known for his publication of Walter Rodney's How Europe Underdeveloped Africa, some of you may be familiar with. Anyway, she's doing, she's written a biography, and in fact she started that biography when she was an MRES student, and then she went on to do it at a PhD level. So we ran that very successfully. But the idea of transformative education, of education that actually caters for what has been identified as a particular need in society or need of a particular population in society is, is not something that's straightforward. It involves uh, some struggle, you can say, and um, it's actually interesting that we, began, we begin our MRES with a study of the Haitian Revolution, just purely by coincidence. And all the students who did the course started with the Haitian Revolution. And in fact, I have a student at the moment who's obsessed with the Haitian Revolution and doing her dissertation on that subject now. Or she was, anyway. I'm not sure what's going to happen now. And this is just some of those students. This is at our graduation ceremony um, last year. The good-looking man at the back there in the hat, just because you might not recognize me in the hat, so. So this is three of my students. In fact, the two on the left are now doing PhDs. Um, the one in the middle, she's currently in Southern Africa. She won a scholarship. She studied, she's doing her research in Southern Africa. She's doing research on something called the Mfakane, which was a movement of peoples in Southern Africa in the 19th century. Anyway, just to give you, this was last October. But then recently, all this has come under attack and threat. And the university in its wisdom 
has decided that even though the university I worked for, or worked for was actually supportive of the History Matters Conference, supportive of the setting up of the MRES, has now decided that uh, it's not supportive any longer. And on the surface, it claims, as many universities do, that it doesn't have enough money, and it needs to have more money, and therefore it needs to attract more students. And its criticism of our course was it didn't have enough students on it, that uh, producing seven PhD students in whatever many years, five years, wasn't good enough, and we should have recruited, you know, scores more and so on. Um, of course, the university expected that without doing any promotion of the course, any advertising, any recruitment whatsoever. But that's another issue. And so we find ourselves in the situation where this day, this year, is being commemorated, celebrated as one in which transformative education, particularly history, is seen by the United Nations as being particularly crucial, particularly important in addressing the legacy of slavery, racism, and so on. Uh, and the course that I teach uh, is being abolished. Now, of course, abolishing the course wasn't, the university went further than that. They said, not only are we going to uh, basically close this course, because you, Professor Addy, teach this course, we're going to get rid of you as well. And so uh, they're getting rid of me probably next week as well, uh, without going into everything, just, just to say that. Now, in the years that I've been at the university, well, we can boast a little bit, I would say, that we have probably, with the MRES, with the PhD, all the PhD students I have, because I supervise about 10 PhD students, we have probably, at the, just at this moment, we have about 16 black postgraduate history students. I don't know whether that's the biggest cohort in the country. Probably is. Most, most of them, well. <laughs> We've managed to establish that in a university nobody's ever heard of, in a place nobody's ever heard of. Um, but of course, with my imminent demise, as it were, uh, all of that will be lost. And in fact, even the students, those 16 students don't even know what's going to happen to them because the university hasn't bothered to discuss or consult with them and so on. So, um, the, the students are, had launched a campaign, some of you may be familiar with it, which received support all over the world. This is particular one is from uh, Brazil. I don't know what else I've got here. This was when we reached 10,000 signatures of our petition. This was a few weeks ago. It's a little bit higher now, I think. Um, um, and the young people, also some of the young people from Young Historians Project supported us and produced these various posters which they put online and so on. And of course I spoke at various events and on TV and radio and so on. Um, anyway, at the moment, all of that, that particular uh, strand of the the battle to save the course, to save my position. And Paul was very kind enough to say that I was the first person of African heritage in this country to become a professor of history. That's not uh, something to boast about. Quite the opposite, in fact. That just shows how, what a problem exists just in that particular discipline. And some people may consider that that's also a legacy of slavery, colonialism, and so on. That even amongst uh, academics in this country, we have very few, very few academics and certainly very few professors. I think even today, I'm still the only person of British, actually, the only person who's gone through every phase of education in this country, from infant school onwards, to become a, of African heritage, to become a professor of history in this country. We're in 2023 now. So that shows the, 
nature of the legacy of the problems that exist. But anyway, all of that is, um, you could say, all that the taxpayer has invested in me over the years, if you want to look at it in that way, um, is being um, abandoned, demolished, and so on and so forth. So I present that to you um, as food for thought. I started off by saying that the UN has identified the theme for this year as the necessity of transformative history to deal with these legacies and the importance of that. And I've demonstrated to you, I hope in what I said, the difficulty of actually doing that and how much struggle is needed to do that, to bring that about. Um, I'm not asking you for any solutions. We will carry on fighting. Um, as much as we can, and there will be illegal battles and various other things. But I think it's uh, kind of sobering to maybe to present things to you in this way. That yes, we can say this is the theme, and yes, we're going to do this and this, or maybe we're not, or whatever. But actually doing it and continuing to do it is often very, very difficult. And I think that, for example, the work that Paul and others are doing at the museum, what others are doing here in Liverpool in various um, uh, in various initiatives, it's important for all of us to consider what role we can play. We come to events like this. I don't know who's here. We come to commemorate things or to celebrate things. But what is it? What we're actually doing? When you leave here, what is it you're going to do to help develop this idea of transformative education? What are you going to do? Who are you going to assist? Who are you going to work with? Who are you going to sit down and discuss with to actually make sure that we are doing something? That when we commemorate this day, this year or any year, what are we going to do to actually be transformative ourselves? And I started off with the, the Haitian Revolution. And one of the ways that we always discuss it in our classes is that what does it show us about us? This is not something about something that happened 200 years ago or whatever it was. It tells us something about our role in history. One of my students was saying to me the other day, oh, it's very hard, this all this campaigning. I was, you know, I didn't ever think I'd do this when I started being a student. Uh, you know, I wasn't, I didn't sign up for all this. I said, well, what do you think people in Haiti signed up for? Did they think, mm, no, this revolution, you know, I'm not sure I want to liberate myself. That's going to be a bit tough. You know, I might have to go on for 13 years. But they saw that society or the world they lived in had presented them with a problem. And it was a problem they needed to take up for solution, for the, in their own interests, even though they may not live to see it. And if you look at the numbers of people who were killed in Haiti, it's very large numbers. I think it's over 100,000, I think, of those who were fighting for liberation lost their lives. There might even be more than that, but at least 100,000. But they persevered. They struggled for 13 years. And the result, they were victorious. They showed that ordinary people, even enslaved people, could take action together, could transform their society. As I said, defeat the three principal armies in Europe, liberate themselves, usher into being a new country and so on. Of course, there were all kinds of problems after and so on, but yet they did it. They've gone down in history as doing it. They were history makers. So what history are we going to make when we leave here, when we go home next week? What is it we're going to do? What is it we are going to transform? You don't have to answer me now. You can sleep on it, think about it, reflect on it. Because this day is for reflection, for thinking about ourselves. That's all I've got to say.